Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode is a story about how ordinary people can start an organization and achieve incredible things. I sat down with two founders of Animal Equality, an animal rights nonprofit that began in Spain and is now a multi-million dollar international project. It's enjoyed very rapid growth over the last few years, thanks in part to a recommendation from animal charity evaluators and a grant from the Open Philanthropy Project. I apologize about the background noise. We were recording at EA Global San Francisco, and we managed to catch everyone having their lunch break. As always, there's a blog post with a full transcript, summary, and links to articles discussed in the show. And now I bring you Sharon Nunez and Jose Valle. Today, I'm speaking with Sharon Nunez. Sharon is the co-founder and president of Animal Equality, an international organization working with society, governments, and companies to end cruelty to farmed animals. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Sharon. Thank you so much for having me. Sharon is joined by Jose Valle, who's the other co-founder of Animal Equality and their director of investigations. He's been involved in animal rights work for 15 years. Thanks for joining, Jose. Oh, thank you for having me. Sharon and Jose oversee the work uh, the organization does in eight countries, providing leadership and support. Animal Equality's work has been featured in some of the most important media outlets in the world, including the New York Times, CNN, BBC, and the Sunday Times, among many others. Animal Equality uh, has also been selected as one of the most effective animal protection organizations in the world by animal charity evaluators for three consecutive years since 2014. Today, I'm also joined, uh, co-hosting, by uh, Natalie Cargill, a barrister in the UK who has worked in animal advocacy charities herself. Great to be here. All right, we've got, got, a, got a full house today. <laughs> um, so we'll get to talking about animal ad- advocacy strategies and how people can pursue a career that most effectively helps animals. But first, tell me, why is animal advocacy such an important area to work in? When I decided to join uh, the animal protection movement, it wasn't because I was particularly interested in animals or because I love animals or any of that. It was because I realized the amount of suffering that it was involved in. And this is not only indicated by the number of individuals, animals that we eat, um, namely uh, mainly uh, fish, chickens, hens and others, but also the degree of suffering. Um, that each of those animals experiments. So could you give us an outline of animal quality strategy at the moment and how that fits in with other animal organizations? Sure. Um, one of the main works that we do is um, investigations into factory farms and slaughterhouses. We feel and we have seen that um, these work documenting uh, the suffering of these animals is, is a um, basics for uh, the other efforts and the other strategies that we um, follow. Um, for example, we also carry out educational campaigns. Uh, we go to campuses and educate students and bring like leaflets, videos, etc., and to show them um, what the factory farming uh, looks like. And for that, we need the footage. We also um, engage in or carry out corporate outreach campaigns where we uh, contact. Uh, some of the most important or biggest uh, food companies in the world to get them to ban the worst of forms of abuse or uh, ban the stream confinement for hens. We're carrying out that type of work in Mexico, Brazil, India, Italy, and Spain at the moment. And um, we also engage with uh, politicians and lawmakers to um, get them to ban um, some uh, forms of animal exploitation and try to pass laws that benefit animals. And for that, we also need those type of in- images that will persuade them uh, that there is a p- big problem that needs to be uh, solved. Yeah, I think one of the main things with us too is that we're an international organization. And I think we're one of the farmed animal organizations that's present in most countries. Um, and that is definitely, um, that we, we carry our three strategic lines that our education corp corporate outreach and legislation in all of these countries. And this has really enriched the strategies of the organization and it's helped us be more effective. So animal equality started out, as I, as I understand, focused on, on bullfighting in Spain. Is that right? <laughs> uh, but it now mainly focuses on, on animal farming. Uh, what led to, to, to the change? And do you, do you plan to, to stick with that focus in future? Yeah, we definitely do. So we started out with uh, bullfighting. I mean, we've always been an anti-speciesist organization. Um, 
we we believe that the species of belonging is not a reason to discriminate anyone. We started out with bullfighting because we thought that there would be a lot of media interest and a lot of public interest in bullfighting. Um, and that's how we gained a lot of momentum in Spain. Uh, but as we continued to grow, we understood that in order to have the most impact possible, we must focus on animals that die and suffer in the largest number, and these are farmed animals. Mm. Why do you think it is that people don't donate more of their um, giving to farmed animals, given that as I understand it, that is the vast majority of, of animals that are harmed directly by humans. I think uh, there are, I mean, many of us don't act in a you know, purely rational way. And in most of the donations, I would say, it's because you have felt moved by a story or because your emotional connection with those type of animals. And I think that explains why most of the donations go to dogs and cats. Although the number of animals affected compared to farm animals is so, so small. Um, and also the direct involvement in, in the causing that suffering, like in most of the people, uh, as we were doing, uh, eat animals. And I think they don't maybe uh, yet uh, know the, that there is a big problem here and that they should be uh, supporting uh, the work that many animal charities are doing. Yeah, and this is something that is changing. Um, and it's also, I think, responsibility of the farmed animal organizations to make the connection, to get people to understand that there's no moral difference between a pig and a dog. Um, so we have the responsibility to make that connection. And but what we're also seeing is that all farmed animal organizations are growing increasingly because people are becoming more aware of suffering is suffering and it doesn't really matter who the victim is. Uh, so what are your personal backgrounds and, and what personally prepared you to, to found an organization like AE? Well, I, I started studying sociology, but I, I didn't finish my degree. Um, I was living in Spain and I decided to move to Ireland. That's where my family is from and I went vegan and that's where I went vegan and I got involved in animal protection straight away. So <laughs> there wasn't much preparation for me. Um, I was prepared in the field. So I was working for different organizations in different positions. And then in 2006, uh, Jose, Javier and I founded Animal Equality. We started out as a group of volunteers and then the organization, we were always very interested in getting media impact. We always understood the power of media. That's why we started doing a lot of uh, protests again against bullfighting. And we also, because I had been working for uh, organizations in the UK, uh, we also understood how important it was to be an international organization, not only to gain experience, uh, but for example, the UK that's considered the, the birthplace of the animal rights movement is very influential to animal rights advocates throughout Europe. So we always understood um, the importance of uh, working in, in the UK and internationally. And we kind of learned as we went. So from become, being a group of volunteers, um, I at least learned a lot about how to coordinate volunteers. And then we became a professional organization, hired people. Um, and as part of animal equality, there's a lot of training. So um, most of the people in our organization spend about anything from 5 to 10% of their time just training. We have an internal program called Sharing and Learning, where we um, are just sharing information and bring different speakers into the organization to give us an hour training, usually once every two weeks. So um, in my case, at least, Jose has more of a background. Um, there wasn't really, I wasn't really prepared to be an animal rights advocate. I, I just had the desire to help animals reduce suffering. In my case, uh, I think uh, my experience or my background, I was part of the, some protests when I was a teenager um, on the union and the workers' rights, and that uh, motivated me to fight for justice. And when I learned about the suffering of animals, um, it just, um, I understood that, uh, you know, that also needed, um, that I should be uh, Involved in that. That it might be a more significant problem to work on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Christina, what, what became of the, the bullfighting campaign? Uh, is, is there still an active campaign against bullfighting in, in Spain? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, bullfighting is one of the, one I would say one of the most important focuses of a big part of the animal protection movement in Spain and Latin America. Um, the suffering of animals in a bullfight is very, very obvious. So it's very... People get involved very much, especially advocates get very much involved with bullfighting. I always tend to think that there's there's also, I don't want to say a positive side, but it's also interesting because I think when you grow up 
in my case, when you grow up in a country where bullfighting is a tradition, there's a lot of people who are just naturally question that because it's just so instinctively wrong. So I know a lot of people who have come into the animal protection and the animal rights movement through bullfighting. And at the moment, there's there's several campaigns. Most a lot of organizations are focused on it. Uh, I think it was the Canary, Canary Islands just um, reformed bullfighting so they wouldn't kill the bull. Um, and it's I mean the marches and the demonstrations that are organized by PACMA. That's the Animal Political Party in Spain, they get tens of thousands of people. So it's a very strong movement. Animal quality is growing pretty quickly. What kind of hurdles do you expect you'll face as it grows? Oh, well, um, yes, we are. So our budget, for example, in 2014, for all of 2014, was $200,000. And our budget, um, our income at the end of 2016 was 3.5, 3.2 million dollars. So um, we've we've of course grown very quickly, but I think that we were and we are prepared for uh, that kind of. Um, it's kind of forcing us to look at the organization internally, uh, like creating the systems, the structure, the protocols, and the processes that the organization needs to be um, stable. Uh, we're also hiring and have hired some key staff to be able to support that growth. So people from human resources, um, we're looking to hire this year, uh, people for project management, people for operations. Um, and the kind of hurdles that uh, I think we are, we've, we've definitely We've definitely had some growing pains, but I think we're kind of coming out of that phase. And I think one of the most important thing for us, or one of the, most, the challenging thing for us, is finding talent. Um, so we have several, not not only in the U.S., but also, for example, in countries like India or in, in Europe. Um, so we're finding some challenges with hiring staff, key staff for our organization. So I would say that's one of the main hurdles at the moment. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. That is that is the. Uh... For me, I think the key aspect uh, and the biggest uh, difficulty um, and challenge, like to find the right people. And as we grow, we need more specialized people. Um, just when we started, it was only three of us, so we had to do everything ourselves. So we had to be journalists. But now, um, having more specialized people will add more value to what we are doing. And although we have grown pretty quickly in the last two years, I will say that it was also pretty uh, sustainable because it is not like one office suddenly went from 10, 15 people to 60. It has been like eight different countries, eight different offices that increased their number, but it wasn't like dramatic uh, increase. So it was very well um, accepted. So we'll come back to the issue of um, finding talented people and perhaps how listeners can potentially get, get involved in and fill those gaps. But um, just now, what kinds of things have you managed to accomplish so far? How do you know that what you're doing is, is actually high impact? It's a very important problem, but how do you know if you're making a difference? Sure. Um, I mean, that is the core principle that guide us, um, how we can do the most uh, good or the most have the most impact. We know that we have limited resources and we want to have um, the biggest impact that we can. And therefore, we have been measuring and analyzing some of our campaigns and efforts, and we have decided to uh, let go some of those and increase some others or, or start new projects. Um, we are analyzed by animal charity evaluators who look at also the uh, resources that we have and the activities and the impact that uh, those activities are having based on the studies like on leafletting or uh, the number of people who watch our videos. And um, so we can uh, come to some conclusions based on, on that. Um, it is still an estimate. Uh, and also in some other occasions, like with the corporate rich work that we have uh, started to do just in the last six months, we have achieved uh, 22 corporate policies uh, that affects over 12 million hens. And uh, we have been in those farms ourselves. We have seen, I've seen myself the hens in standard battery cages and I've seen uh, cage free facilities and uh, like the difference is obvious on the impact that it, these uh, policies have on those animals. Um, in addition to that is the campaigns that we are doing um, on legislation. We are working with the European Parliament to get uh, um, rabbit cages banned. And that will affect over 340 million rabbits every year. And rabbits are um, 
kept in battery cages just like hens uh, and they have the highest uh, mortality rate than any other animals like one out of five rabbits born in a farm dies in the first weeks so it, it is a very very significant uh, difference for those animals so, so with the political campaigns i guess you have a bit of a challenge knowing if you run a campaign and then the legislation passes or you get something something similar to what you want it happens how do you know that it was you who caused it yeah, in this case, uh, we have worked with the uh, European parliamentary Stefanek, who introduced that, and he included our Im images from our investigations in his report. And um, political, for example, a, a specialized political uh, magazine um, recognized the impact that our campaign had, uh, for example, in um, the weeks before uh, the European Parliament vote uh, in favor of these uh, measures. Um, we had an online campaign. Uh, we gather over 120,000 signatures that translated into 1,200,000 emails sent to the uh, parliamentarians. And uh, they told us, like uh, many of them, they told us how that affected them. And we were showing them the, the footage. And it, it was key for uh, getting that uh, change. Yeah, no, I was going to say, in the case of India, for example, I think we can see that uh, very clearly. So um, the government of India has issued um, several reports on the welfare of uh, chickens, hens, and uh, dairy uh, cows, as well as uh, cattle markets. And what we're seeing is that they are including our recommendations in the report. So we've met with them, we've shown them the results of some of our investigations, and we've given them specific recommendations on how to improve animal welfare for all these animals. And then all these recommendations, or partly these recommendations, are included in their reports and their in their in their laws or in the drafts they're doing of the law. So um, and many of them even mention animal quality. So um, in in our case, we think, especially in the case of India, uh, Europe, and a recent initiative that we presented in the Mexican Senate through a senator that is called Viva Gastelum. I mean, she worked with her team in Mexico to present and draft uh, the proposal that was then presented in the Mexican Senate. So um, in I mean, of course, there are other things to take into account, like the, the level of consciousness about the issue, investigations that have been done in the past, just society, societal support. But in, in, in these three cases, we do see that there is a direct relation between our work and the legislation change. In the case of India, and uh, the Senator Diva Castellum, who introduced that uh, initiative in the Senate, and that was the first time that uh, the welfare of farm animals and the treatment of those animals at the slaughterhouses was uh, was uh, discussed in that uh, forum. Um, she um, exp uh, explicitly mentioned uh, animal qualities investigation. I've been into uh, several Mexican slaughterhouses filming those images that she later introduced in, in her report. And when that initiative is passed, that will affect literally all animals uh, that go end up in the slaughterhouse in Mexico. Yeah, if I can just... <clears throat> like um, just with the previous question you were asking about our impact um, as Jose said that's our driving force but we have like internal systems in animal quality to measure impact monthly so we have a document that we call the monthly metrics where we have di different KPIs different metrics we're measuring and everyone in the organization puts the information in the document in a monthly basis so we can see real time things like how much media impact did we have in June in comparison to July how many investigations did we do how many corporate policies did we win how many campaigns that we launch. Um, and that enables us to identify some areas of growth, some areas of improvement, compare what each country is doing. Why did this country have more media impact than this one? And then adapt our strategies and our, um, and our work to that. So I think it's very important to have these internal systems to constantly be measuring the impact of the organization. Sounds like you're doing a really great work. I was wondering, so uh, a lot of the, the examples you've given just then were things like working with policymakers and governments and parliaments. How does that compare with what seems like some of the earlier strategies of focusing on, on creating new vegans or um, people interested in vegetarianism? So how do you sort of balance that with the more institutional change? Sure. I think like this also reflects how the organization has evolved over the years. Uh, initially, we were in the early days, we were focusing so much on um, individual change. And we were thinking that if people hear the arguments and they see the images, they will feel enough motivated enough and persuaded to change. But then we realized that uh, motivation is not enough and they also need to have the ability to change or 
uh, at least perceive that they, that it's easy for them to change. So that also led us to uh, focusing more on changing systems and changing, like, for example, introducing uh, meat-free options in the cafeterias and the universities so the students, after they receive one of our leaflets, they think, oh, yeah, I, you know, I can do this. I can eat, you know, uh, without meat. Uh, but then they, when they go to the cafeteria, they have the options there. Um, otherwise, it will be a recipe for failure. And um, after uh, analyzing the work that we have been doing and all the efforts and money invested and the time and also the work done by other organizations, we uh, have learned from them uh, and we have come to the conclusion that um, legislation and the campaigns on corporate outreach are going to have the biggest uh, result. But it's not um, just one or the other. Like um, we see that all these uh, three lines of work complement each other. Like in order to, for example, pass a, a law in a certain country, we also need some uh, support from the public. So the legislators know that that measure is not completely, you know, anti, um, how would you say? Maybe? Unpopular. Unpopular. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we see it also like a holistic approach. Being institutional change, one of our key areas of focus at the moment, we also think it's important to empower people to reduce their meat consumption or go vegetarian or vegan if they're ready. And at the same time, make sure that they have those vegan options in their cafe and their, in their like college uh, cafe. And at the same time, work with corporations to improve animal welfare and work on legislation. So we think it's, it's, and probably not going to be one thing, uh, or, or it's not going to be one thing that reduces the most amount of suffering, but it's going to be a combination of forces. So as much as we can, and always trying to understand where our resources are best used, we tr try to kind of tackle all, all these uh, issues. Where do the undercover investigations fit into this sort of multi-part um, strategy? Because I know for, for many people, you know, seeing those kind of undercover videos, you, you don't want to ever eat meat again, but also they've been used in sort of corporate investigations and parliamentary um, reports. So where does that kind of work fit in and how do you measure the impact of it? I think uh, investigations into factory farms and slaughterhouses are essential. Uh, and I think it is not a coincidence that the animal agriculture industry, uh, therefore, tries to ban them. Like, for example, in the case of the U.S., introducing uh, so-called AGAC laws that will make it a felony crime punished by several years in prison for just documenting um the abuses that uh, happen in these places because they know how powerful those images are and that they move the consciousness um, and people's hearts and minds on about this issue and um, it also brings politicians on our side and it puts companies in a very very difficult position so um, over the last 10 years we have carried out over 70 um, investigations in 13 countries in total and uh, we uh, will continue doing so because we have seen it um, like for example in the case of the Mexican Senate initiative that we mentioned earlier um, that has um, been the investigation in those places has been the basics for that initiative otherwise it wouldn't be possible. So with an undercover investigation, can you give me a sense of how much it costs and how many people are involved and how long it runs and like what level of media interest you might get from a single investigation? Sure, of course. Um, yeah, the, there is a very wide range uh, in all these parameters. For example, if I take the um, case of the, the first investigation that I carried out, um, visiting some Spanish slaughterhouses, that costed just a few hundred dollars because it was basically me uh, contacting the facilities, preparing some stories and pretext, and getting the camera out there and filming in for a few days. So that was pretty, pretty cheap. Um, in some other occasions, it can be up to like tens of thousands of dollars if it, the situation is far more complicated. This changes a lot depending on the country. For example, in the US, um, organizations like us or others will be doing investigations um, putting one of our staff working uh, at these farms and slaughterhouses. They have to work there for months on end, wearing a hidden camera, um, far from their homes. You know, they have to, there are plenty more expenses. So that will be quite more expensive. Um, one of the investigations that we did, for example, in Germany, we installed hidden cameras into a duck farm that only costed us like a 
we calculated about 400 uh, euros or about 500 dollars more or less uh, we came back uh, came back to the farm several days later recovered the footage we caught the workers killing the ducks with pitchforks and uh, well and dumping them you know alive and into the containers and that got massive media coverage in germany uh, how many investigations do you have to do to uncover like something like that that's extremely provocative? In the case of uh, that particular investigation, that was the only farm that we filmed. Yeah. Um, in the case of, for example, chicken hatcheries, we visited seven chicken hatcheries over a month and a half. And um, the footage that we got uh, has got uh, has obtained over 40 million views uh, online uh, without any additional cost for us. I think one of the, the issues with these this kind of footage is that everybody um, knows it's out there but assumes, well, that was an extremely exceptional case, you know, and mm -hmm. obviously that, that, that person is being prosecuted and that doesn't really happen and most farming isn't like factory farming. So what can the animal advocacy community do to get the message across that, no, no, this is, this is just farming. Farming is basically just factory farming. Sure. Uh, yeah, that is one of the typical responses that, you know, the industry puts forward, like, to defend themselves against this. They usually claim that this is just, like, one bad apple, you know, that all their facilities is not like that. So we have a number of ways to uh, show that that is not the case. One of them, I think, is... Um, as we continue doing uh, investigations, as we do more and more and more, um, I think the argument is their argument that it's just one case or, you know, one bad apple is weaker and weaker and less credible. And then, for example, we film in over a hundred uh, pig farms in Spain. So the industry has a very difficult time to say, oh, no, this was not, you know, this was just one case. Yeah. We also film in farms that belong to the uh, head of the president of the industry and like um, chicken farms, pig farms, etc. Uh, farms that should be kind of a role model for many others. And uh, we even stream in live uh, the images over Facebook so people can see it directly. And uh, lastly, um, another reason why we can show that this is pretty standard is that in some occasions we are filming with permission of the people there. They know that we are filming. They look at the camera. They speak to us. They smile. They do everything as they uh, used to do. Uh, and I think that... Uh, it speaks for itself on how common uh, their behavior is. Yeah, and, and if I can add to that, um, it's also important to show people that a lot of the things that we're filming are legal, right? Like mutilations or teeth cleaning or tail docking, just having animals spending their entire lives in cages where they can hardly turn around or spread their wings. Or I mean, these things are legal and they're part of the system. So um, putting, putting focus on that helps people understand how inherent, inherently cool um, factory farming is. And another thing is that what we have found is that in almost, if not all, almost all the facilities that we have visited, we have always found instances of animal cruelty. So, it's, again, it's, it's part of the system, inherently cruel. Do, do the owners or workers ever express shame for what they're participating in? I mean, to a certain extent, uh, when they are exposed, um, some of them defend their practices. I mean, we've, we've, we've had instances that are kind of surreal with, I remember once a pig farmer, after one of our most gruesome investigations, saying that pigs in Spain uh, lived a very comfortable life. And, and at the same time, in the background, people could see footage of some of the things we have, some of the investigations we have filmed. And other, in other instances, we have found remorse. Uh, people have given up their job or they've pled guilty. Um, but it's not necessarily, I mean, there are people who are cruel. And of course, this is something that has to stop. But it's, again, it's also the system inherently. Uh, one related project that A has been working on lately is Eye Animal. Uh, so t tell everyone about that. Sure. I Animal is a virtual reality project. Uh, when I learned about virtual reality, uh, which was at that time um, used mainly for gaming, um, I read about uh, 360 degree cameras that are filming in all the directions. And I immediately thought that if I bring these cameras into the farms and I put them inside the cages, when you watch that same footage with a virtual reality headset, you will see everything from the perspective uh, of the animals from inside that cage, uh, which is a very unique uh, 
point of view. Uh, so far, like when I've been into slaughterhouses on farms filming, I know that I'm just selecting a, a portion of, you know, what uh, it's happening in that place because I cannot show, I cannot film absolutely everything. And I always thought, you know, I wish I could bring people here so they can experience it and see it by themselves. But with these type of cameras, it allows us to do uh, that somehow. It's, it's pretty, pretty close. So uh, also when you watch a conventional video in your screen, in a tablet or in a TV, those images are contained in that frame, right, in that TV. And that allows you to put some emotional distance from, from that. And you can even look, you know, in, in some other direction and ignore it. And you are always reminded that you're in this room, you're in your living room watching this. But when you wear a, a virtual reality headset, there is no frame. There is You are in somehow like inside that video and if you don't like what you are seeing in front of you for example the workers killing this pig when you look down uh, you'll see the blood like you know come above the or over the floor or it makes you it tricks your brain into believing that you are in that place or make it very very close I remember um, watching an animal at an animal rights conference. Um, it was it was incredibly distressing, and I think everybody found it incredibly distressing. Um, but obviously, maybe people at an animal rights conference um, weren't people you're going to convert away from from eating animals. So I'm wondering, sort of, you know, how many of these headsets do you have? How many places have they been? What kind of um, data have you collected on on their conversion rate? Um, getting people to to no longer eat animal products. We have over uh, 90 headsets. We have provided them also to other animal uh, charities in from China to Singapore, Chile, Russia, Israel, etc. We have uh, translated the films to other languages. Uh, we provide the equipment and the films and the training for free to all these uh, organizations and also individual advocates. Um, we have shown it in um, universities across the US. Um, in Just in the last year, we have organized over 167 events, I think, um, visiting the campuses and, and getting the students to watch this. Uh, also in the UK, in Germany, in Italy, and in Spain. Uh, so far, we have shown it directly and one-on-one -on -one interactions to over 63,000 students. And also uh, online it has gotten, uh, and through the media it has got over 70 million views, but that will be the standard footage uh, or stories related to that. Uh, that is also part of the impact. And the response, uh, of course, we have shown it to animal advocates and, you know, we are, we tend to be more sensitive to these topics uh, because we, we wanted to uh, get their feedback, but we, are showing it like 99% of people are not animal advocates and their response is very, very positive. They're always shocked. Uh, after watching the footage, they usually need some uh, seconds just to process what they have seen. And uh, we encourage them to sign a pledge to either reduce their meat consumption or uh, leave it off uh, completely. And it's over 80, 85% uh, of people who uh, signed that pledge. There is also a good number of people who don't want to sign the pledge, but it's uh, because of privacy concerns about leaving their uh, email address. And we are doing a, a study to measure all this. Do you have any follow-up uh, with the people who took that pledge to see whether they're following through or not later on and, and kind of taking into account the fact that they might want to tell you what you want to hear? Yeah, so we're addressing that two ways. So um, on campus at the moment, as Jose said, we're collecting people's uh, email and then we're sending them uh, newsletters throughout, I think it's the following two to three months uh, with information on how they can uh, change their diet, uh, either reduce their meat consumption or go vegan. Um, and then we're surveying them at the beginning and at the end of the newsletters to see if there really has been a diet change. And then as Jose said, we're carrying out a study where we're actually measuring the impact through a number of surveys of the diet, like how much it is. How do you survey their diet? Uh, just, just, just yes. asking them? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, in this case, like, because we cannot, uh, like, follow them or, or track them. Yeah. Like, Break into their kitchen. <laughs> we would love to, but, uh, yeah, um, because of the limitations of the study, uh, it is, uh, yeah, we are asking them. Um, 
So this study is carried out with fan analytics in uh, universities in the U.S. And we have three groups. Uh, there is a, a intervention group that watch our film in with a virtual reality headset. There is another group uh, that watch this exactly the same video but on a tablet. And then there will be uh, there is another one that is a control group. Um, all of them fill uh, the first part of the survey after watching the v film. They fill finish. Fill, uh, fulfilling the second part of the survey. And then a month after that, um, we are asking them via email. So it's self-reported uh, consumption on pig's meat. Oh, and we are comparing how different it is uh, among those three groups. So, so this kind of social science research can be really tricky, like, even for professionals who spend their life doing it. Have you found it difficult to hire people who you know, have a sufficient experience, you know, studied psychology or done a PhD in psychology and... and uh, able to, to do these surveys in like as thorough a way as possible? I mean, at the moment, where the study is being carried out by Fanalytics, so they have their own team of uh, sociologists and data analysts and uh, psychologists. We are looking to hire a data analyst uh, in 2018. Um, so anyone who's interested in applying for that position uh, is more than welcome. Um, we, do, um, we do kind of think that there may be uh, challenges hiring someone for for this position, and um, some of the so some of the surveys that we've developed um, for, for example, our our own newsletters, they're done in house with some support from uh, different organizations. Uh, but we think that it's important for us to hire a data analyst with a background in sociology and just doing surveys and studies in animal. In relation to this study that we are carrying out with Fanalytics, we carried out three pilot studies to identify some of the problems and things to solve. For example, uh, we learned that um, we had to have a canopy, so the students who were approaching us, they didn't, they couldn't see the headset, so they couldn't, you know, uh, be influenced by that, by the type of technology that we'll be using. And also we reach out to the effective altruism community, uh, to asking for feedback. We got a very, very good feedback from, I think, over a dozen of, of people. Uh, and we have also obtained the help from and advice from statisticians um, without borders. So to, to broaden back a bit um, to animal quality more generally, um, you're an international organization. Mm -hmm. You became an international organization very quickly. And um, what are the benefits of that? What, what do you learn by having offices in different countries? Are there different styles of advocacy that work better in, in some places rather than others? Um, are there any drawbacks to being an international organization? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean... Carrying out this type of work at an international level um, has been a very uh, enriching uh, experience for us. We have groups in eight different countries, that is five different languages as well, and uh, a good number of uh, time zone differences, which means also uh, it brings its own challenges, uh, but it provides a more diverse um um, number of, of opinions or points of view about this. And, uh, although we are one organization, we are also listening to what our country directors are uh, telling us and use their knowledge to adapt to the content and, and the activities to what works in their country. Yeah, a lot of the knowledge is shared, and that's very important for us. So we encourage, for example, the different departments, even though we have executive directors in each country, we also have a communication department, we have a corporate outreach department. These are international departments, and the department itself encourages every person in the department to be in contact. And also at the same time, it allows us, um, so this is something that especially as we, we were growing as an organization, we had very limited resources. Um, so we were able to hire people in countries like Spain and Italy, where we paid them a, a good wage, but a fraction of what it would cost us to hire the same person in the United States or even the United Kingdom. Um, so all of our program, all of our design department, for example, is in Spain, our video department is in Spain, our programmers um, are in Germany, um, and we're we're able to hire people um, not only because of not only with talent, but also taking into account what are the resources of the organization and where it's best for the organization to hire these. Teams. One of the uh, additional advantages of working internationally is um, I think we are more efficient because when we produce one material, let's say one leaflet or one video, we don't need to uh, redesign it from zero, starting from zero. We just need to translate it and, and 
change the text and maybe change one of the photos. And uh, uh, another one is that uh, there are some countries where it's easier to fundraise, uh, has a better possibilities than others. So, in, for example, at the moment, we are not fundraising in India or in Mexico, and all that work is funded from the U.S. where we uh, can fundraise more and easily. Um, so we redistribute the income um, according to the needs or the potential uh, for each country. Yeah, so no, I have, and I've, I can add on to that. I think it's very interesting as advocates, and this is something we've always discussed, not to be limited by certain things that sometimes are within our control. So um, the country, at least for our case, the country where we were born or isn't necessarily the place where you can or you need to um, do your advocacy. And we understood that there may be other countries, like I was saying at the beginning, the UK, where we could do work and would probably have a higher impact than we remained in Spain. And that was kind of the thinking behind our global expansion. expansion sorry. So how can we have the biggest impact? Maybe it's not only not remaining in Spain or not remaining in Europe, but trying to think about other countries where there's more animal suffering, where there's um, not as strict animal welfare laws and policies, where population is maybe more open to animal protection. And um, I think this is something that's it's been very important for us, and I think it's a very important discussion point, or should be an important discussion point for organizations as they grow. You recently moved into India, right? So we've been in India since, uh, yeah, since 2012. Um, we have an ex our executive director in India, Amruta Bale. She's been um, in the animal protection movement for five years prior to joining Animal Equality. And we see there's a huge potential uh, for helping animals. Yeah. I guess if you're saying salaries are lower in some countries, I would imagine you could fund really enormous campaigns on a shoestring in India. Yeah, yeah. It's one so, of the cheapest countries in the world to operate. Absolutely. That's the case in India and that's the case in, that's the case in Mexico. Always being mindful that we need to pay all of our staff good wages uh, so that they have like they have a good quality of life but of course we're able to we're able to um, carry out campaigns and investigations in these countries for a fraction of what it would cost again in the US. Do you plan to open in new countries over the next few years or is it more a matter of deepening the countries that you're already in? So as part of our strategy plan um, we have decided that we will um, take advantage of new opportunities that come up. And uh, we, for example, started working with different uh, groups of people in China, and we intend to um, translate some of our content to Chinese. Uh, we're going to be watching out for new opportunities. Jose and myself are going to be traveling to other Latin American countries, apart from the ones we're in, um, to do different talks and to meet activists there and see how we can be helpful. Uh, but our main focus um, till 2020 is going to be to strengthen the organization in the countries it's in. So, for example, we started in Brazil just this year, and with two people and staff, we've been able to grow our Facebook group to 200,000 followers, carry out the first investigation into hen farms in the history of Brazil, win seven corporate policy victories, uh, establish contact with celebrities, establish contact with key um, people, uh, key journalists. So what we see is the potential of us growing in Brazil is huge. So it's important for us to continue to grow in this country, to continue to grow in Mexico, and also create the infrastructure in internationally, some of the things I was talking about before, like human resources, operations, to be able to sustain all of this growth. So answering your question, we're watching out for opportunities, but our main focus is going to be to grow in the countries. So one of the, the campaigns you've been working on is to ban the use of eggs from hens in, in battery cages. I wonder if you could tell us about uh, what those involved, how you're measuring, measuring the impact with those and uh, plans going forward. We are carrying out those type of campaigns at the moment in five countries, in Brazil, Mexico, India, Italy, and Spain. In Brazil and Mexico and India, uh, the hens are in what is called standard battery cages, uh, where about six hens are kept in, in one cage. And the space per hen is uh, smaller than what it will be an iPad. So these animals are spend their whole life basically in the same space as their body occupies. Like they cannot really move much more than that. Um, I have personally seen up to 11 hens in, in one of these cages. And in some occasions you can see even uh, you can see less than that. You can see maybe th four or three, but that is just because uh, some of the of those hens have already died. And um, 
in the last six months, we have uh, carried out these campaigns uh, against some of uh, the largest uh, food companies in the world, in these or in these countries, and we got over 22 uh, policies uh, affecting over uh, 12 million hens uh, per year. So how exactly does that work? How do you do you work with the producers or do you, how do you put pressure on them? Just sort of break it down in terms of how that works. We approach them, generally speaking, is the um, food providers or food services uh, mainly uh, because they are um, most common or more usually the most uh, sensitive to pressure. And um, we ask them, you know, to... Um, change their policies about that, like we bring reports and we show them the world, uh, uh, wide trend on that and how other companies in other countries are doing the same. And um, in some occasions, they are through persuasion, through uh, meetings, uh, what we call like positive corporate rich type of uh, work, um, we can get some of those uh, commitments. But in some other occasions, um, we have to rely to pressure campaigns um, and there like we can contact their investors uh, about uh, us starting these campaigns against these companies with something that the investors are not uh, very eager to hear and uh, like we easily try to take over their Facebook pages like uh, with messages from consumers, uh, online petitions, protesting at their headquarters um, and a number of uh, and a wide range of tactics uh, that we use like from uh, billboards to online ads to uh, investigations in facilities of suppliers linked to them. Usually it's the suppliers or the actually uh, producers uh, the ones who are the last uh, to change because of course like uh, it will be very expensive for them to change so um, but they have to do so when all their clients are requesting them to provide them with uh, cage-free eggs. Uh, so how have those kind of campaigns been going? Uh, have, have you managed to, to, to convince a lot of uh, companies to change their practices? Yeah, I mean, I think that they've been going uh, phenomenal, phenomenally well. So um, Animal Equality launched um, its corporate outreach department in November 2016, so last year. And in that time, um, we've hired 10 people internationally. Um, so as Jose said, we're working in five countries. Uh, we've launched a number of campaigns, uh, and we've uh, won 22 corporate policies that affect approximately anything between 12 million and 15 million hens uh, who went, won't spend their lives in a cage. Um, so we, it's one of our most successful departments and we're uh, looking to continue to grow um, moving into chicken welfare and also to grow our corporate outreach department in Germany and the UK. I know there's been some some controversy about the, the cage-free campaigns and one of the most common um, complaints is that actually it's not better um, for hens to be outside of cages because um, they're hierarchical animals and they will often fight and injure themselves mm -hmm. or they don't actually have more room. Um, what is your response to those kind of comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I've personally uh, been into um, cage-free facilities and the standard uh, cage uh, farms have seen those animals myself and I think the I mean I have no doubt like the that the differences are not very very noticeable and the improvement for those animals are really uh, worthy uh, but also uh, for example there was a study uh, funded by McDonald's before they committed to actually change all the whole um, um, egg supply to cage-free, uh, they funded this study to show that uh, cage-free facilities were not really uh, providing uh, those benefits to hens. But also they were using farmers or they were involving farmers who had no experience in managing those type of farms. So that was a, a very uh, clearly flawed uh, study. Um, there are some others that show that uh, they de there is a significant decrease in the suffering of those animals. And although there are, of course, like challenges and some other welfare problems, as you mentioned, um, the case is that within a cage, uh, there are very, very little improvements that you can uh, 
provide to those animals. Like the, their life is literally hell. Uh, once they are out of those cages, there are some other problems, but there is a higher welfare ceiling. Like you can achieve so many more things. Uh, within a cage, there is very little that you can do for them. So you've explained why it's really cost effective, but I think you might might even have uh, have undersold it. Uh, so one of you, one of the funders of this kind of work who supports you as well as the Open Philanthropy Project, and they're they're pretty hard ass about wanting to get you know good estimates of actually like what kind of bang for buck are you are you getting with these campaigns. Uh, and I'm just looking at one of their posts here. They're, they're estimating that so far these campaigns have spared uh, 38 pence a year of cage confinement per dollar spent, which is just um, an enormous amount of, of suffering on, on the part of chickens uh, reduced uh, for, for, the, for the kind of millions of dollars that they're, that they're spending. So I'll put, I'll put up a, a link to that report uh, along along with the podcast and uh, people, people can take a look and decide for themselves. Yeah, and if I can add to that, there is, I think uh, corporate campaigns, uh, corporate outreach campaigns are very interesting because you don't only have like the estimate that you've just given, but they also touch on some of our other strategic lines. So for example, education, what we're finding is with our corporate outreach campaigns, we are reaching millions of people through the media because we're doing investigations to support those campaigns and we're doing protests to support those campaigns. So we're getting the public uh, to learn about the welfare challenges of animal products. And at the same time, uh, what we are finding too when we're working with many governments is that they say, well, the companies are doing it. Uh, but if we have a number of companies that have already uh, agreed to significant welfare changes, it's going to be easier to change legislation, at least in some countries. So it's, 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 it's that estimate and it's also what we're finding is their campaigns that affect a lot of other um, aspects of our work. So that's some very positive stuff. Uh, but what, <laughs> what do you think is animal equality's uh, greatest weakness as an organization? Um, I think uh, our, <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, we, were, we were joking before uh, about it. I think one of our weaknesses is, I mean, I know it's typical, but it's, it's honestly lack of funds. I mean, I think that um, if we were able, if we had more funds, if we had more resources, we would be able to... Um, continue growing in the countries we're in. We have, I think, a very good system of growth where, um, as Jose was explaining before, the hirings um, and the management of the new hirings fall under the responsibility of each executive director. And we have 12 um, executive directors and international directors. So it's the responsibility of the growth of the organization is not falling under one person or just a few people in management. Um, and we are also, as I said before, hiring for people to support and, and people who are going to be supporting kind of the growth of the organization. I think if we had more funding, we'd be able to hire more people like that, but we would also be able to think sooner about expanding to other countries. So I was mentioning China, uh, other Latin American countries like Argentina and Chile, where we see um, a lot of potential for good. Uh, and then I think another challenge that we're finding is finding talent. Um, we are definitely in some countries, we think there there is um, a shortage in our hiring pool and we're trying to kind of work through it by hiring um, companies that, that help us to hire people, by trying to reach new people, like try to reach new audiences when we're when we have a, a job description or a job position open. But definitely uh, talent is one of our one of our challenges at the moment. And some very, very specifically, uh, I would say creative talent. So um, it's been very hard for us to find good designers and good video editors. We've just found a very, very good one um, in Spain, but it took us several months looking and it was a comp it was a good wage. And I, I think that's definitely something. And then programmers. Um, so we're currently looking to hire uh, at least one, but possibly two programmers for the organization. Um, and this is something we've had a lot of difficulty finding. So um, as you might have gathered, <laughs> a lot of our audience is pretty obsessed with cost-effectiveness estimates and I wonder if you might be so kind as to share any of those estimates you have in terms of how many animals people can help per dollar. We have uh, the estimates that animal charity evaluators uh, have uh, produced uh, analyzing our work in uh, 2015 and up to the middle of 2016. According to them, and based on the work that we did in that period, um, we have spared 4.8 animals per dollar of our budget, and uh, that is also translating into 1.2 years of suffering per dollar. Um, 
in if we break it down by some of the work that we do, uh, we find that uh, the work that we are doing on investigations, for every dollar spent in that department, we are sparing 2.7 years of suffering. Um, so, which I think it is very, very uh, effective. Uh, we haven't included here, or A's haven't included yet, the estimate for copper average, and those are going to be far uh, higher than this. Yeah, so do you have any other sense of which projects kind of stand out when you analyze each one on in terms of how cost-effective it is? So like, are some of them better than others and maybe should be should be growing at the expense of others? Oh, I mean, I think definitely um, investigations because investigations, I would say, corporate outreach and legislation investigations because they touch on education, they help our corporate outreach campaigns and um, they help us uh, push legislation forward. Uh, corporate outreach uh, has the same effect. Um, it, as part of corporate outreach, we're educating the public about animal welfare and animal rights, um, and then we're engaging in meaningful conversations with companies um, and legislation. And, and I think this is because the amount of animals, especially with corporate outreach and legislation, the amount of animals it affects. So, um, for example, when the when this uh, new law was voted in Europe um, to improve animal welfare for rabbits, that's going to affect 350 million animals. So it's it's very difficult for one single educational campaign to affect that many animals, and it's even more difficult to measure how many animals it affects. If you get someone to reduce their meat consumption or go vegetarian or vegan, you don't really know. You're only relying to a certain extent on self-reporting. You don't really know how long they're going to be vegan for, um, how, if they're going to go back to eat meat. But when we change the system, when we change legislation, or when we change um, uh, corporations, um, there's always the challenge of enforcement. But I think in the case of Europe, it's pretty clear that um, there's going to be a significant improvement for welfare for rabbits for 350 million individuals. So I would say that is probably the programs where there's the most potential for good. I see you've also got your uh, monthly metric sheet out there. Uh, do you want to uh, share, share some of those numbers? Uh, how are you guys doing at the moment? <laughs> Yeah, every month we collect a number of uh, metrics, like uh, from grassroots outreach, uh, so to speak, like uh, some different metrics. Uh, not all uh, relate to the impact, uh, but it's uh, still useful for us to know, for example, the number of cities where we have uh, uh, organized events or how many stalls or um, how many leaflets distributed and how that translates into animals spare or years of suffering spare. And we do the same for, um, the I Animal Project and, uh, our reach and social media and corporate outreach. Um, yeah, I can, I can give you some numbers for the first six months, um, of, uh, 2017. So, uh, we reached, um, we showed iAnimal to 30,000 students, for example. With iAnimal, we reached 285 million people through the media, including the New York Times, where the grand story about our latest iAnimal presentation and investigation. Um, we've reached 500 million people through social media, uh, had over 38 million video views for over 10 seconds on social media. Uh, we've released... 30, we've presented 39 investigations, and the reason why there's 39 versus 13 is the number of actual investigations we've presented is because um, our, for, let's say that we have a chicken investigation in Germany, that was presented in Germany, but it also got media in Spain, it was presented in Spain, in Italy, and even in Mexico. So uh, we had a total of 39 releases, investigation releases. Um, and I think one of the most staggering numbers is that we managed to reach 3. Point, we had a breach of 1.5 billion with our media coverage just in the first six months of uh, 2017. So this is what's something I was mentioning before. We're tracking this on a monthly basis, and we have several people in the organization looking into it and tracking their numbers and looking, comparing their numbers with the numbers of other countries. And then we always have a global conversation about our metrics to see how we can improve them. Um, just curious, what does the 1.5 billion refer to? Yeah, that is uh, reach. It, it is not a number of people directly, of course. Like we haven't reached, I wish, like yeah. <laughs> I one out like of, of the five world. or a quarter <laughs> of the world population, I wish. But uh, yeah, it's like, for example, if we have a number of investigations in Germany and we had uh, all these different releases, uh, we... Every time we release an investigation, maybe 40 million uh, reach uh, that we have, and maybe 40 million people that have seen that. But over the year, when we put together all that, so it's uh, 
one same person can uh, have seen access or seen our footage several times. Yeah. So this is if you get an article in the New York Times, then you count like the, the total number of people who read the New York Times. Yes. It's, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Per article, that will yeah. be the potential. Maybe the real one is, is is smaller than that, but that is the best uh, metrics that we can get, and that yeah. any other groups are using. Yeah. So that metric gives you a reason to try to target newspapers with a huge reach. Exactly. That, that's the goal. Exactly. Yes. yes. In some occasions, we also choose some media. Uh, because of uh, their strategic value, for example, business uh, publications, because then we know that the animal agriculture industry leaders are going to read those. So it, it and hopefully reads. squirm in their seats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the Financial Times or things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's turn now to the whole section of what uh, people listening uh, can can potentially do if they've been convinced that this work is useful and uh, they think it's uh, bad that, that animals are suffering horribly in farms. What kind of roles do you need people to apply for? At the moment, we are uh, hiring for a number of positions. We are also looking to hire uh, operations and project manager. In Brazil, we are hiring for administrative associate, corporate campaigns coordinator, video editor, food policy manager, general counsel, general manager. Uh, you have some others over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to share? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um I mean, we have several positions opening up. I mean, I suppose it's for listeners mainly in the United States and um, probably the United Kingdom. We have uh, two positions, an operations and project manager um, currently open, and we will probably be opening up several more positions before the end of the year. Um, a data analyst, a human re data analyst will probably be 2018, but definitely a human resources uh, person before the end of the year. Um, and... Usually, we will probably open up for someone for more international positions. Um, so someone like a programmer or a designer or a video editor. Um, so, I mean, we have a website, like a link, sorry, dedicated to our positions. So they can visit animalequality.net slash jobs, and they can see all the positions that are open at Animal Quality. And in the near future, we'll be hiring for more positions for in the corporate average department, which means like uh, getting in contact with the companies and meeting with them and ne negotiating or uh, launching campaigns, pressure campaigns against them. So you've got certain positions available now. I wonder, more broadly, is there a trend of the animal advocacy community needing a certain type of person to fulfill a certain role? And um, somebody who's perhaps thinking of studying before they go into work, what kind of things would you recommend they look into if they want to work in animal advocacy? I mean, one of the things that... Um, one of the things that we look for very specifically is passion. And the reason for this is because we find that if someone has the passion and they want to work for animals and they have some basic like personal characteristics, like for example, they're proactive and they're hardworking and they're problem solvers. What we find is that I would say 70 to 80% of our positions could be filled. Um, in the case of other positions, I think that, I mean, we find that we're needing more and more technical positions. And a very, very good example of this is people in IT, data analysts, programmers, people who are familiar like th with things like big data. Um, we really want to be an organization that kind of spearheads. We already have iAnimals, so we are seen as an organizational, sorry, that's very technologically savvy. We want to continue being perceived that way, but at the same time, we think it's very effective to be aware of what's happening in technology, what's happening in, in different companies and trying to think how we can apply it to our organization. So I would say that in the near, I mean, we already need technical skills like programmers and data analysts, but as we continue to grow, this is an area that we definitely want to explore more. And another very important area, I think that where it's, very, very difficult to find the right people is in the development of fundraising. So, yeah, if um, if there's people listening to this that uh, are, might be interested in pursuing that type of career, uh, they will be very, very welcome because um, that is definitely one of the um, areas where we lack more talent and more people. And it also requires some technical skills. Like there's um, several careers in fundraising, like prospect searching, that really is looking at data and comparing different kind of parameters to, to try to come out with which are the people that we would better target when fundraising. So if somebody um, doesn't suit one of the roles you have open at the moment, but really wants to work in effective animal advocacy, are there some other organizations that you would uh, recommend that they check out? 
Absolutely. I mean, um, I think uh, definitely animal charity evaluators top charities. Um, um, we think they're probably the most or some of the most effective organizations in the world. Um, so that's the Humane League, Good Food Institute, um, and Mercy for Animals. So those are definitely organizations um, I would recommend people apply to. Um, and also look at the list of standout charities. Um, a lot of them are international charities or charities that are not necessarily in the U.S. So there's Albert Schweitzer, for example, that's in Germany and Poland and, and some other countries. Um, I think that if someone really wants to have an impact and they want to help animals, I think that um, Animal Charity Evaluators website is probably one of the best places to visit and they'll be able to understand why the charities they've selected are so um, impactful and also visit those websites and see what kind of jobs um, organizations are looking for. So I imagine there's going to be quite a lot of people listening who would like to make a really big contribution to an animal-focused organization in future, but they're quite young, they maybe are still doing their undergraduate degree or they're, or they're early in their career, kind of getting the first few roles. Do you have any advice for like what majors people should choose to study or where they should go to work early on, where they can get kind of the mentorship and skill gaining that they need in order to you know, get into the position to do the kind of work that, that you are doing now? I will recommend, like, for example, um, I'm very excited about the all the innovation related to clean meat and, you know, um, culture cells. So if they are interested in biology, I think that will be uh, very, very important. If they can contribute on that, and then um, international business, uh, that will be also very helpful for corporate rich uh, type of campaigns. Yeah. It's interesting because you tend to assume, you know, people who want to do animal advocacy do sociology or psychology, and it seems like it's really changing to be more science focused and uh, business focused. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking talking to Bruce Friedrich uh, tomorrow. So uh, he, he's the head of the um, Good Food Institute. So I'll find out a bit, bit more about the clean meat side of things uh, then. And I'm sure um, listeners would also be interested to know um, how they could build a professional network within effective animal advocacy and sort of experiment early on with these kind of ideas um, in order to later prepare for a career of the kind of work you do. Sure. So I think the, one of the most important things is to um, be informed, of course, like why do we think that this is a priority? And it's because of the amount of suffering. I mean, um, the reason why... Personally, I think some things are wrong and some things are right, or because in case of things are wrong because of the amount of suffering they cause, or if they so cause suffering at all. And what we see is that farm animal um, suffering is one of the biggest kind of suffering or causes of suffering in the farm. Um, so I think that it's important to, to be informed. And then um, I would start out volunteering in one of these organizations or working as an intern and um, also understanding what are the organization's needs. Because as you were saying before, we did used to need sociologists and psychologists, and we still need them, but we are also finding, at least in animal equality, that we need programmers and we need people who also have the business side of things or have experience in marketing. So I think it's very important to be in contact with the different organizations, with animal equality, GFI, Mercy for Animals, and try to understand what their needs may be now and in the future, and maybe if we really want to have an impact, maybe study career paths that kind of lead us in. Do you know any organizations that, that offer large numbers of volunteer roles uh, where people can, can skill up? So um, we offer different uh, forms of volunteering in a lot of our different countries, not specifically in the U.S. at the moment, though we do have are looking for interns for social media and to support with our educational initiatives. But I know that organizations like the Humane League and Mercy for Animals, again, are also looking for um, volunteers. So often different uh, problems that people can work on tend to attract uh, different kinds of people disproportionately. So are, are there any particular skills that you feel like you're flooded with where uh, you, people who maybe shouldn't try to be cultivating those skills as much because there's, there's already uh, so many of them? That's a, that's a yeah. difficult question. Yeah. Sounds like probably not. Yeah, I no, I would that, say, yeah. I would not say so. I mean, um, I, I think that it's also very important to under, for people to understand what their natural talents are, right? I mean, I think if someone's going to work in fundraising and they're going to be working with donors and prospects, well, it is important that they have certain people skills and to a certain extent they can be developed, but to another extent they can't. So I think it's very important for people to understand what they're naturally skilled at and then what their passion is. And they're somewhere in the middle, they will probably figure out what they're best at but at the moment i think i mean there's no skills that we're that we're lacking okay 
So are there any other options that you want to uh, highlight to people if we're thinking a little bit more broadly, like uh, how you talked about going into clean meat, so that's kind of research. Maybe are there any startups that you'd like to see uh, started, or, or do you think it would be useful to have animal advocates go and try to get elected in, in politics? Are there any other uh, just different approaches that you'd like to discuss? I think what uh, you just mentioned on, uh, yeah, getting into politics and being able to influence the political parties from within, uh, that can be a very effective, uh, but um, it will also depend so much on the country and, and the particularities of that. So it will have to be analyzed very, very carefully before deciding that. And then other aspects will be like... Um, earning to give, I think that is also very, very uh, effective. Mm, yeah. Uh, so let, let's talk about earning to give. So like across lots of different problems, sometimes it's better to go and, and, and make money and donate it because that's kind of a limiting factor. Uh, it, with other problems, it can be that there's a lot of money available, but there's no one to, to spend it in a useful way. Where do you feel animal advocacy is here? Do you think it's like more that we need relative to other problems? Do, do you need more people to go earning to give and, and providing providing funding? I think we will uh, all uh, the effective altruism animal uh, charities will benefit greatly from that. Yes, okay. especially I think if I think if people don't have the skills that we need the most immediately, I think it's probably best if they're into kids. Yeah. Let, hypothetically, would you rather have like a, a very good staff member who has maybe like five years' experience in relevant areas, or uh, so, so one of them applies to you to come and work to you? Would you prefer that? or say $100,000 in extra funding a year? I mean, it's a very, again, it's a complex question because it yeah. also depends um, on the department they'd be working in. So mm. if they're working on fundraising, probably a staff member. We're trying to isolate it. I would probably say the staff member because okay. uh, the value they can bring to the organization is probably several times higher than $100,000. If it were a higher amount, then I would consider it. So if it were 200000 If it were $500,000, I would definitely reconsider it, yes. Okay, so it it's sounds a very, like, very rough estimate. So it sounds then like many people are not going to be able to earn half a million or donate half a million a year so you'd probably rather have them apply but if someone's in a position to you know earn a lot of money you know in finance or high-end law or something like that if they're able to make more than half a million a year then they should think about the funding side of things i would say so yes what are your okay. thoughts yeah i think i will put the uh you know the amount of and this is like so difficult to estimate right uh but in abstract i will lower that amount um maybe to half of that or even lower than that um i mean with some there are some positions that we are really lacking talent or the you know good candidates and where the impact that they can have is so big uh but a majority of our positions uh we can find other people who can do a great job still so um and we also see that the number of years of experience is not really that important. Uh, it will be more like the type of skills, the uh, how they fit into uh, the culture of the organization and teamwork. So I would definitely lower that amount. And like if someone can uh, yeah, donate about $100,000 a year or even less than that, I will think it can be very uh, significant the difference that they make especially when we transfer those funds to India or some other countries yes. it's possible you, you have different people in mind because it's, it's very yes. possible to talk, it's yeah. very yeah. difficult to talk about a hypothetical person like you know True. how good would they be at it the job it depends on and, the skills yeah, too exactly. that they bring to the organization exactly uh, just one question that we uh, skated over a bit quickly was um, what, what conferences can people go to either in Europe or um, the US or potentially India as well where they can really network and meet people like you and potentially find mentors who might be able to help them out with their career. So there is the Animal Rights Conference that happens in the U.S. Um, every year. It was just a few, it was just a week uh, ago in the East Coast. Um, there's um, the St. James Politics Conference that happened last year in Europe, and I'm, I think it's going to happen again this year in Europe. I think it's going to be in November. Um, so there's a number of conferences that I would recommend those two I can think of. Yeah, there is uh, CARE um, that is in November in Austria, um, which is... Um, Conference of Animal Rights in Europe, um, and then every two years there is taking action for animals in Washington D.C. So next year it will be um, time when uh, it's organized in the East Coast. How risky is it to go into a career in effective animal advocacy? So if somebody 
went to work for AE or a similar organization and it didn't work out for whatever reason, would they be sort of stranded with these skills they couldn't apply elsewhere or would there be other areas that they could transfer into relatively easily? I can't imagine that there would be a position in um, an animal rights organization or an animal protection organization at the moment where they wouldn't learn transferable skills. I mean, um, we're seeing that very clearly with the people we're hiring. I mean, we're hiring people for, we just hired a few people for develop, our development department, and they're learning um, so many skills that are transferable to other positions. Um, social media, I mean, you, you're not only learning in social media, but but you're also learning about communication, and all these are transferable skills. Um, I mean, I, I can't think at the moment of any position where skills wouldn't be transferable. Do you think it's uh, really important for young people uh, in animal advocacy to kind of find an, uh, someone who's older who can you know, show them the ropes and help to support their career moving forward? Should people be really prioritizing finding, finding mentors, or is that something that's not, not strictly necessary? I find that like very, very helpful. I think it will be, yeah, very good for them to identify some mentors who can advise them and, and guide them. Yeah, it will, I wish like we had those when we started in Spain. I think it can save a lot of time and a lot of, uh, spare a lot of frustrations. Mm -hmm. I suppose, yeah, the, the typical ways that kind of people find mentors is going to conferences and, you know, getting a job and then like speaking to people who are more senior. Mm -hmm. Another one, if, if you find those difficult, is potentially just to write content online, like write things that are interesting and do some original analysis and kind of impress people with, with your capability to think about things and then you'll get, you know, potentially find, find supporters. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest downside of going into this career? I mean, I think that one of the biggest downsides is the, to a certain extent, the emotional implications of some of it um, for some areas of work. So, um, I mean, to a certain extent, we are exposed to very shocking footage, um, and sometimes the footage is, is difficult to watch. So there can be some kind of emotional challenges to dealing with that kind of um, footage or just the, the kind of reality that animals are subjected to. Um, so that's definitely, I think, something that could be a downside. Um, I think that that small downside is very much, um, it's very small in comparison with the the focus on impact. And I think the great thing about effective altruism and something that has been really, really meaningful in my life is really understanding that as individuals, we can have an impact, we can measure that impact, and we can know to a certain extent how much good we're doing in the world. So I think that even though it's a challenge, it's also very important to have an impact-oriented organization or to have impact-oriented individuals that are that are focusing and reminding people constantly about the good they're doing in the world. And that, that's something we do at Animal Equality, like not only with our metrics, but for example, at the beginning of most of our meetings, we start with successes and, and we remind people in our organization what are the things that we've achieved like in the past month or in the past two weeks just to make sure that we keep morale high and people focused on the bigger picture and what we're achieving. So if somebody who would like to work um, with you or a similar organization, how do you think they could tell if they would be a good fit for that kind of work? I think that, um, I think that, I mean, I think to a certain extent, uh, they're going to, a lot of the positions are going to be very similar to positions they would find in any other field, right? So, I don't know, social media or um, working in marketing or working even in development. I mean, they're kind of going to know if they're, if they're suitable for those positions. Um, regarding, I think, um, I think that one of, as I said before, one of the most important things is, for us at least, is not only have the skills and the talent and the experience, but most importantly, the passion, really wanting, wanting to make a difference in the world. So I would say that someone is suited uh, if they have the passion, if they have the desire to really help animals and to make a difference in the world. And once they have that, um, and I invite anyone who has to, to contact us, once they have that, I think that there's always kind of skills that can, they can develop that they can bring into the animal rights movement. Maybe it's not as a full-time uh, person in an organization. Maybe it's as an intern or maybe it's, it's, it's as a volunteer or maybe it's working and earning to give. Uh, but I think once a person has a passion, I think that they probably need to start thinking about, okay, how can I really use my skills and use my talents to impact animals? Another of the character characteristics that I will uh, mention that indicate whether that person will be a good fit, I think, for us and for like both that it will work for both the candidate and animal equality is that they are flexible and willing to change uh, based on evidence or on arguments. Um, 
like we are constantly changing and leaving out, you know, or stopping some of the work that we were doing before and modifying it. And I think it will be very difficult to work with if someone is not willing to accept uh, those changes and you know, the day-to-day -day, uh, realities of running an organization in multiple countries and the, all the complexities that it brings. With people who are so passionate about the area, how often do you get people burning out just because it's so distressing, the, the, the issues that they're dealing with? I mean, of course, we're, that, that is definitely, um, that's definitely a challenge, I think, for anyone who is working in kind of, I don't know, for something that's distressing or may cause uh, distress, be it human issues or non-human issues. Um, I think that it's very important for organizations. I mean, I think it's important for individuals to understand like self-care and uh, really take care of themselves. But I think it's also important for organizations to put systems into place to make sure that people are taking care of themselves. Um, so as I said, one of the things I mentioned before is just reminding people, having, for example, a great office environment. Uh, that's something we work very hard on having at Animal Equality in all our offices, having a great organizational culture. So um, we have... Uh, I think a very good organizational culture, and we, we work very, very hard to maintain it. Um, celebrating our successes, as I said at the beginning of all of our meetings. Um, so it's definitely a challenge, but I think it's very important for organizations and individuals to recognize it and put the systems in place to be able to, to avoid it. And I mean, we have 60 people on staff at the moment. Uh, we have 14 uh, directors, and a big percentage of our directors have been with us for over five years or seven years. Yeah, I think also it is important for us to limit the exposure of uh, the staff to images and, you know, the cruelties of factory farming. If they don't need to watch it, like there is, you know, what's the point, in it, right? But uh, there is some other positions that, because of the nature of the work, require that exposure. But there are also ways of reducing that, um, the emotional impact that it has. Um, so we do take that into account very, very uh much. Are you hiring in countries like India or China? Uh, if, if someone happens to be listening from Beijing? Uh, we are. Be, yeah. We're hiring for almost seven positions in India. Uh, we're not hiring in China at the moment. Uh, we're I mean, we are looking for volunteers or people who are willing to contact us and maybe um, translate some of our some of our uh, some of our work. Uh, but we are hiring for seven positions in India. So we're hiring for a, a lawyer, a general counsel. We're hiring for a food uh, policy manager. We're hiring for two corporate outreach positions. Um, we're hiring for a video editor and a few administrative associate. And I think there's one or two other positions we're hiring for at the moment. Um, so yeah, if someone's if someone's listening, um, we would be more than welcome. To interview. So I, I didn't tell you guys I was, I was going to, to ask this, but it's just occurred to me there's almost so many roles that you're um, offering, so many potential skills that you could absorb that it's a little bit like people might not know which one to actually try to specialize in. So would it be possible for you to describe, like, if you could just have three ideal people who are going to, like, appear and apply to work at Animal Equality, uh, like, what kinds of skills and qualities uh, would they have if you had to just pick, you know, just the most important ones? Okay. Do you go? Uh, yeah, I think, like... Um, Operations manager is someone very oriented at processes and, you know, how to define those processes and optimize them and have a very analytical mind and approach to this. That will be very uh, beneficial for us, I think. Then another one will be um, careers related or um, with development, as we mentioned earlier, that in itself ranges from uh, having some personal skills like to deal with uh, or meet with uh, donors uh, or uh, mayor donors, but it can also imply uh, analyzing a database and, you know, and looking for some, uh, some of the analyzing those data and identifying some interesting prospects. Um, I think those are some of the, the key ones including also um, online marketing and the possibilities that technology is offering us in, in, on websites and with artificial intelligence and some other feature uh, advancements that our companies are already looking into or applying and that I think the animal movement is, not, is, is lagging behind, is not yet applying. No, I mean, my, my answer was going to be very similar. So I would say like raw skills, we want people who are organized, who of course, I've already said it several times, who have the passion, but also who are organized, who are 
flexible, um, and who are, who are who are proactive and who are willing to, as Jose said, who are comfortable with change and who are comfortable with the complexities and challenges of an international organization. And then career path. So I would I would differentiate like technical skills. So some of the things Jose has been mentioning, like a data analyst, programmer, um, people who are very good with numbers and with data. Uh, but also we need people from a creative side. So again, we need video editors, we need designers, uh, we need people to really be uh, good at making our organization communicate better and be more creative. So I would say those are kind of the raw skills and then the, the two paths, technical and creative. And there is also another one, which will be uh, investigators. We are always looking for uh, undercover investigators who are willing to um, go into these places and document what happens to these animals and it's extremely difficult to find the right people and also for us like we provide the training we provide all the everything but uh it, we need them to be working on this for a number of years and be able to do it sustainably so so uh sharon and jose is there anything you'd like to say um the final minute to really inspire people to um think about what you've said get involved and apply um yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that most of the people who are listening to this are probably interested in, in helping and in making the world a better place. And I think that there is probably one of the most important things they can do is to focus on animals and more specifically on farmed animals. And this is because of the incredible, incredible amount of suffering they can reduce and the incredible amount of impact they can have. Uh, so I just want to encourage anyone who is interested and who wants to help animals and who wants to uh, just have a greater impact in the world to uh, visit our website, animalequality.org, and uh, contact us at um, any point about how they can how they can help, and we would be more than happy and welcoming. Our guests today have been Sharon and Jose. Thanks so much for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you're interested in starting your own effective nonprofit, then you should apply for coaching from 80,000 Hours. We can give you a lot of guidance on what kinds of interventions are effective and introduce you to other founders who've managed to do this already. If everything goes to plan, then next week I'll be putting out my interview with Professor Philip Tetlock, who has done extensive research into how good people are at predicting the future and how they can do better, and also how we can potentially improve decision-making within government and important institutions. If you're not already subscribed, you can subscribe by searching for 80,000 hours in your podcasting app, and then you definitely won't miss that episode. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.